Hello and welcome to another episode of Business Unknown, made just for you by Briar Trock. I'm Dan Nicholl, and each week I catch up with a South African business leader, business entrepreneur, tap into their life experiences, the journeys that have taken them to where they find themselves today, and from both those journeys and the experience gathered along the way, try and get a little counsel, a little guidance for these very difficult times we find ourselves in around the world in general, but here in South Africa in particular. And today's guest is somebody who's got plenty of experience. He's the go-to guy when it comes to startups in South Africa, the former banker who's now involved in oh, hundreds and hundreds of startups. I don't think even he knows quite how many there are. His name is Michael Yordan. Before I introduce him formally and say hello to him, just a quick note on how the two of us first met. I was hosting a wine tasting evening at the end of the Cape Epic, having collected bottles around the journey. And at the end of the evening, Michael came up to me and told me that I needed to start a wine show and showed me a video of an American called Gary Vaynerchuk. I watched it, thought, Michael, you're done asking me to start a business. He must have had a little too much Chardonnay. So I smiled and ignored him. He phoned me the next day and the day after and the day after that and told me to start my wine show. Now, when Michael Yordan phones you three days in a row, you do as you're told. And that's what kickstarted my wine business. And Michael has done the same for so many other businesses, so many other entrepreneurs and startups around South Africa. And so he's a very special guest to have with us on Business Unknown and gives me a great pleasure to say hello. And indeed, thank you to Michael Yordan. Well, uh, Dan, thank you for having me, and um, thank you for doing it over this lovely lunch. I really feel spoiled today. Well, I'm looking forward to tucking in. Bertus's food looks terrific. I, I am just a, a little sad, though, because we've had many lovely meals together, and it's just one of the, uh, the many parts of life as we know it now, where we can't sit back at a gorgeous restaurant, have a couple of glasses of wine, and, uh, and look out over the views. Uh, life has changed quite dramatically. Has it had a big impact on the life of the Jordan family? Yes, of course. So uh, we've been affected like uh, everyone else. We're very fortunate to live on a on a wine farm. So the setting is beautiful. And during the very tight lockdown, at least I could get out there and do a bit of mountain biking or go climb a mountain or swim in the dam. Um, so, so we were very lucky and, and a privilege to be be in that position. Um, but I think um, where it's been the same for everybody is it's a reversion back to basic values. Um, you know, it's you and your family. You need to get on with your family. You can take it to higher levels if you want to. And you somehow had more time, and we still have more time, to really think about life a little bit more deeply. What is it that you really want? And um, I, I think it's fair to say that some of the things we were doing were probably excessive. You know, there was excessive travel, but be it business travel to other continents, or just travel to get to meetings where you could do things quite efficiently, either over texting, messaging, or video conferencing like we do it now. So there was too much traveling. And um, you speak to about food. Of course, we all like to go out to restaurants and to be served, but you can go back home and you can learn to prepare your own meal with your own ingredients out of things that you grow in your own garden or that come from your own neighborhood. So I think it's been a great time of reset where you could think about the world again and think about what it is that you really want out of life. Because so often, We've just become captive to habits and to get in the car and be at work at a certain time and come back. And before you know it, the week's gone, the month is gone, and the year is gone. So that has been the positive thing for me is that you could think about life deeply and change. It's also been, I found, a time for a lot of reflection. We've had slightly more time on our hands than we normally would, not rushing off to those meetings you speak of, being able to spend time with family, which has been terrific. I'd like to do a little reflection on the life of Michael Yordan. We know you now as the go-to person if you've got a startup. If Michael Yordan looks at it, then it will work. We know this for a fact now. But before the current startup space where you have so much fun, there was Michael Yordan, the banker. But if we go back even further than that, if Top Gun had Tom Cruise and the uh, the Air Force thereof, uh, then the South African Navy world had Michael <laughs> Yordan. <laughs> so then I have no idea how you want me to respond to that. But I, I think I've been lucky in life. I've, I've been lucky predominantly by figuring out that life is all about people and that life is better if you surround yourself with the right people. In business, you have to surround yourself with people who are better than you and then you know the business will do well. And I found in life that if I surround myself with people who are funnier than me and you come to mind, 
then you also have a great time. So life's around people. That's that's my response. <laughs> All right. Neatly sidestepped. There might have been a rugby career in the past there somewhere as well. I asked that question. I referenced the naval career because you went from being in the Navy to the world of banking, and it doesn't seem the most natural of transitions. How did that come about? How did you, you leave your crisp white uniform and make your way into the banking world? Well, let, let me take the naval thing head on first. Um, of course, it wasn't voluntary. It was a time where you know one had to do military service. But in a way, there too, I was lucky to have gone to the Navy. It somehow suited my temperament better um, to learn about navigation and boats and winds and um, uh, making uh, knots and ropes than it would be to, to have a rifle and, and, and to kind of um, do things in the bush. Um, and, and there too, I, I was lucky to be on the officer's course. Uh, in, in fact, it was that crazy period where it was shortened. So I was trained for the whole year and then let go. I mean, they never really got any, any good use out of me. The banking thing for me was easy because I always wanted to be in a bank. Um, now, I must tell you, I didn't always know what it meant. Uh, I mean, the main picture was that, you know, there were bank branches and people seemed to be doing interesting things, especially intellectually interesting things behind um, those branches. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to be in business. I knew I wanted to be in commerce. And it just seemed to me that banking was at the center of it all. You know, nothing really happens in the economy or in the business world without the bank somehow being touched. And uh, that's what drew me to it. You found your way into this banking world. You spent a lot of time there. You rose to the very top of the particular organization. In that long career in banking, Give us two moments, if you can. One which you look back on and you think, gee, I was amazing. I don't know how I did that, but that was just fantastic. That was a, an absolute highlight of the Michael Yordan story. And then the other end of that spectrum, a time when you shake your head and you either, you can't believe you did that or you can't believe it went so appallingly wrong. What was the, the biggest mistake, perhaps, that we can maybe learn from? Sure. Okay. Uh, two big, difficult questions. In terms of, like, wows, I think the, the big wow is when you um, get to a certain level of seniority and you are incredibly certain of yourself and then other people do take you seriously. Um, I, they say that happens to a lot of people, that in a sense you have a kind of an imposter syndrome and because you are so well aware of you know, all your shortcomings. Um, generally, I find with people when I got to a new position, I would say, look, I'm going to give all of you a chance. Please give me a chance. And whenever that team thing started working, when the team started gelling and you started achieving, that for me was always a, a, a big wow. In terms of the negatives, um, there were lots of them. And the reason why there were lots of them is because my entire leadership style is an incredibly empowering one. I, I simply believe you surround yourself with the best people, the best team. Obviously, you agree what the strategy is. But then good people want to be empowered. They want to be let free to be able to go and achieve that. And then, of course, when you do that, things can go wrong. Over time, the things that went wrong, well, the things that worked out were so much better than the things that went wrong. But there were many, many occasions, and I'd rather not kind of um, think back of any of them specifically, where somebody approached you and said, you know, we made a big loss here, or something went wrong there, or this IT project didn't work, or we had irate clients and so on. And obviously take these things incredibly seriously, because as the leader, you're ultimately accountable for them. So you're accountable for things you didn't do, but you have to back up your team and you have to go to, let's say, the board meeting or step out in the, in the PR conference and, and take full accountability for, for what's gone wrong. Um, but that makes you a better leader um, is to actually back your team, let them get on with it. And if things go wrong, um, you know, take that on the chin. So fair to say then, if, if not looking at a specific example, looking at the learning from all of that, that there is a lot you can take away from those bad times. And the important thing is to use that knowledge from them, to use that experience and make sure that you put that to good use going forward. So, so the, the basic principle uh, of a good leader, I think, is to give credit away. You know, when credit is to be given, don't try and say things went so well because I was in control or I was the boss. Name those people um, tell, tell their peers that they've done well. But when things go wrong, that's when you've got to say, ultimately, I'm in charge. The buck stops here. It stops with me. And then you find people don't mind working for you because you're going to give them credit when they've done well. And when things don't go so well, you're not going to take their legs out. 
You are a mentor to many people with the various companies that you have an interest in. A lot of people look up to you and try and spend time with you to, to learn from you. You had the opportunity to do that for many people. In particular, though, a gentleman by the name of Paul Harris. I uh, kind of get the image that uh, when you started off, you were running photocopies for him and making sure that his shoes were nice and well polished. But that started off not just a, a great relationship, but also a great friendship and one that I, I suspect was a big part of the platform platform you built for yourself? Yeah, I started as a management trainee at Rand Merchant Bank, which is a very junior position, and he was the CEO at the time. On Fridays, uh, one could go to the pub and meet everyone else in the bank. It was small enough that nearly everybody was there. I knew everyone, but it was highly uncomfortable if the CEO wanted to speak to you. You, you know, he was so senior. I worked out a strategy of always having a few questions at hand. And I would ask him the question so that I didn't have to say anything. And while he was answering, I'd think of more questions. Anyway, over time, he did approach me to become his executive assistant. That was an incredible opportunity to see banking from a bird's eye view uh, in a way that few people are privileged to do. And after that, um, we always kept in touch. He, he remained either CEO of RMB or First Rand um, and often sent me into difficult places, you know, where things had to be turned around or fixed up. But because I knew through my exposure to Paul how he thought and how he would react in certain situations, it actually made life a lot easier for me. And yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate to say we, we're friends and, um, and we're also partners in, in some of the new business ventures, particularly Rain, the new mobile network, which he chairs. Um, and that, I think is uh, going to be as exciting a journey as his startup journey in Rand Merchant Bank was. The ability to take on all of these new roles that you have is because you've allowed yourself the time by freeing yourself up from other spaces. And it's something I admire greatly about you. You haven't held on to things. You've worked out, right, I've, I've run my time here. I look at not just the bank, but your time with Wines of South Africa, for instance. You were a trustee with the Cape Wine Auction. Lots of different spaces where you've spent time. Is there an art form to knowing when enough is enough and when it's time to move on? Or is it just gut feel? Uh, look, it's a philosophy. Um, you, you really do need to say that my work here is done at some stage. It's important to not let the job that you're doing start in affecting or infecting your ego, which often happens. I mean, you can think of examples all over the world in politics where people have to be pushed aside or where company CEOs hang on too long. You know, you can add your style or your angle to a new business, but in very, very few cases, should you outlive, let's say, a decade uh, as being CEO. So for me, it, you, you know, if you set your mind on something up front and you say, I'm in this role, I want to achieve certain things, and you make it very clear actually to everyone else that you're going to be out of it at a certain time, life is just so much more interesting because for every door that you close, many more doors uh, always seem to open. It's a great philosophy. It's not one everybody has mastered, but you certainly one of those few. You say goodbye to the bank. You had been shuttling backwards and forwards between your home in Stellenbosch and the office up. You then moved down permanently to Stellenbosch, which is where we find you now. And I think that's an appropriate time uh, for a, a little gastronomic sorbet because uh, we have not just each other for company, but some splendid food. I've got mine beside me here. Now, you can't see it if you're, uh, if you're watching or listening, but what we have here is from Bert as Basson. Uh, there's some ham hock, which came on the bone, some pumpkin pie, uh, some beautiful pureed potato, uh, some courgette, a spot of olive oil, uh, and waiting a little later, some vanilla cheesecake. Uh, we've, we've had a couple of meals uh, with Bertus Basson, responsible. I think of Speck and Buena, his little restaurant in Stellenbosch, and I know uh, you and your uh, significantly younger wife, Rose, uh, spent spend time at when you can. It's a, it's a delight, Stellenbosch, from that perspective, isn't it? You've just got some absolutely cracking places to go and eat. Well, I suppose it's one of the benefits of also being in a wine region. Um, you know, wine regions don't typically just produce wine. They also draw tourists, and uh, tourists actually give rise to all of these wonderful restaurants, many of them on the wine estates, others in town. Of course, right now is a very, very tough period for them. Um, the foreign visitors are absent. Um, locals are only slow in coming to the scene. Um, only very recently are people allowed to travel within their province. And on top of all of that, they're not able to serve wine. Um, and anyone who's been in a restaurant trade knows that you not only need, does a restaurant need to be quite full, um, your margin really comes from what you sell on top of the food, uh, i.e. the wine. So 
I, I feel very sad for some of those restaurants out there. And I really do hope that they make it because um, it's, a, it's a wonderful part of the wine region, but it's also part of tourism. And it's one of the few macro trends where South Africa can grow. We can grow the economy and create a lot of jobs. Um, so let's hope it gets better soon. And Michael, you have a particularly personal relationship with the wine industry. We've referenced once or twice already, Bartney, the wine farm you live on. If you haven't been out to Bartney, I highly, highly recommend it. It's beautiful. The wine is terrific. And if you go there and mention my name, they'll let you stay there and give you free wine. You'll have a great time. It was almost, though, Michael, a place that you weren't able to call home. Your grandfather had owned it. It had fallen family hands. You then wanted to bring it back into the family, but it took a, a last minute phone call from a guy called Herman to allow Barthony to be yours. Yes, it's incredible how fate sometimes uh, shapes history. In this particular case, Herman was very keen to buy the farm um, and we happened to uh, encounter him on the way there, as I understand, to sign the offer to purchase. But he listened to my story, which was that my grandparents had lived there in fact, their graves are even on the farm. And he just looked at me and he said, you know what, this farm wasn't meant to be, meant to be mine. It was meant to be yours. Um, of course, the seller was, was quite irritated that um, his purchase had, had fallen through. And it took me about a year to then renegotiate that I could actually acquire the farm. But what's lovely for me today is that um, I'm actually the third generation of your dance on, on Bartony. And our daughters that are living there will be the fourth. And it's wonderful to be able to hand something like that further down the generations. And to do so with the fine cellar that you have and this wonderful wine, which uh, we both love and we both know it tells such a great story. It's a great way of chronicling history through different vintages. What it's also done, though, is give you a base for the latest reinvention of Michael Jordan, which is the angel investor and the startup king of South Africa. Was this something that you thought, right, I'm going to move down to Stellenbosch and I'm going to get involved in startups and help South Africa across the board and all these spaces or did you just kind of gravitate into that space? And one of the things I've, I've learned in first round um, is the power of intrapreneurship. Um, that is if you get the right individual to run a certain area and you ring fence that area as a business or a profit center, amazing things can happen. You know, I've just learned, um, as I said earlier, the secret to success in life and in, in business is people. To get the right people, you give them the right challenge, and very often, all the problems that somebody else experienced in that area just disappears. So I knew I wanted to do something in the entrepreneurial space once I'd left the big corporate, but I was not clear at all on what that would be. Um, at, at first, you know, I made the mistake of you know having coffee with everybody who wanted to have coffee, and that just you know got too much. I joked and said, "I don't drink coffee; I drink wine," and, and that was even worse. You know, the amount of people who wanted to, to drink wine and share their ideas. Over time, I've learned. Um, in this entrepreneurial space, what tickles me. And it really is an entrepreneur that already has some track record of solving a very real problem. So there are many, many businesses out there, and all of them are valid, but I want to be involved in businesses that somehow make society a little bit better, or the life of South Africans a little bit better, whether that's education, or giving them better data access, or making you know, banking cheaper and letting people save more money. There's got to be something in it where I feel this is a real problem and we are moving the world forward. And the nice thing is that, um, you know, business and capitalism, which is sometimes under threat, is really probably the most sustainable way in which we can be improving the world. And all I want to do is I, I want to help entrepreneurs who start up new businesses um, to do their bit which you do tremendously well, as many people can attest to. Michael, I'm fascinated by the range of businesses, the range of startups that you've involved yourselves with. I suspect that speaks to your natural curiosity as much as anything else. The one that particularly fascinates me, though, was the decision to go into banking. I've got no doubt it struck a chord of terror into the hearts of everybody at your former bank when they realized exactly where you were heading. It was clearly, though, a space that you felt had not just the need for change, but the opportunity to do something quite special. Yeah, when I left First National Bank, I had no intention of going back into banking. Um, you know, I, was, I was very loyal to, to uh, First National Bank and First Grand and the people that, that helped me do well there. Um, so first I got involved in a whole lot of other businesses and I learned about being in the entrepreneurial world as I explained a bit earlier. Um, but of course, there's always wine and what happened is 
um, actually on a weekend away, one of my old co colleagues, Yatin Narsi, and I um, were just philosophizing uh, about the world, how we could make the world better over lots of bottles of red wine. And somehow at the end of that evening, it turned out that we said we would like to start a bank, but one without any of the constraints of big banks. And those constraints are things like old systems, big buildings, high cost structures, and revenue that you need to defend that is sometimes not that defensible in the new world that we entered. And yes, so we hope to, in the next couple of months, launch Bank Zero. Um, we haven't quite said it, but you know you can deduce what the fee structure will be for, for Bank Zero. And we do think it's, it's going to be something that hopefully is successful in South Africa and we can take elsewhere in the world. And incidentally, that's a model for a lot of these startups here is um, South African businesses that can start real local problems but the world today is such that you can scale to many other places in the world and go and solve those same problems elsewhere. So this is a great laboratory to start new businesses. And I would encourage people in South Africa who sometimes see problems, don't just immigrate. Why don't you start a business to solve that problem? It um, will make you happy. Maybe it will make you wealthy and you'll um, do some good in the world. Which leads rather nicely into my follow-up question. You suggest that the name of Bank Zero might well reflect the fees. I suspect it probably reflects quite a few bank balances in South Africa at the moment as we go through extremely challenging times. People are looking for encouragement. They're looking for some guidance. How do we get through these times? Can you take one or two lessons from your startup time and give those to people as experience in terms of this is what we can learn via you to try and make our business journey a little easier over the coming months and years? So, so Dan, it's tough out there. The people that I interact with are struggling. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm amazed at how few people in South Africa say it's important to say because it gives you something to fall back on if times are bad. So um, some people are quite unprepared for it. The startups that I've involved with, have, um, and I've you know, tried to also guide them in, in the sense, have all had to go back to first principles. And first principles simply says, I'm not going to tinker around with my product. I'm going to go back and say, what is the core need that I'm trying to solve? Is there maybe a different way of doing it? Do I, and this is a word that startups like this, pivot? Do I change what I'm doing? Um, and I'd, I'd like to say that most of them have actually taken something which is an immense challenge and turned it around into an opportunity. If I may just use like one wine example, the business Port to Port, um, we thought they could deliver their wine online, which is one of the areas that has seen a massive boost, boost during lockdowns elsewhere. And suddenly it was forbidden in South Africa. You couldn't order anything online, including wine. So the founders you know, got on a plane and went to Heathrow and Port to Port is now selling South African wine in, in the UK. Now that's a type of example of what an entrepreneur would do to make their business successful. And instead of just moaning about the decision, which may be irrational, just got on with it and made a successful business decision. It speaks to the ability to learn from change, to understand it, to take advantage of it, and all the more so during a crisis. And I think it was a conversation we had over a virtual glass of wine a month or two back where you gave me an absolutely wonderful line about the opportunity in crisis. I won't steal the line from you. I'll let you give it to us uh, and then explain to us why you feel, as, as weird as it sounds, it's actually a really good one to learn from. Well, Dan, I, I do recall the line, and I, I wish it was my line. Um, in fact, I've looked it up, and it's ascribed to many, many people. But the line basically is that you must never waste a good crisis. Now, this is true for the country. Um, we've got a crisis in South Africa, which is actually a great opportunity to reset things and do things differently. Um, and business people will know this as well. Um, if there's a crisis, relook everything. Look at your own cost structure. There's a chance that your cost structure is just too high or too fixed. You know, maybe you must reduce it and turn it into variable costs. And look at the pricing of the product or service that you offer. You know, demand is weak out there. Maybe it's a good time to actually have price reductions or, you know, price the product differently to suit the market out there. So, so you know, you, this, is, this is very tough, but use the impulse of what you're seeing from the market right now to go back to the very basic principles. Don't waste a good crisis. Make all the tough decisions and, um, and things will be better. By the way, now is not a time for businesses to excel. It really is just a time for them to survive. And because it could stay tough for another three, six, eight, or nine months, 
And if you manage to survive until after that period, chances are many of your competitors won't have survived and you will just by definition emerge stronger. So really just try and um, survive in these tough times and you will have done well. If there's an industry for whom those words would strike home, particularly, it would be the restaurant industry uh, going through really difficult times. But that does give us an opportune moment to get your thoughts on the meal that we've been surreptitiously sampling through our conversation. Uh, Bertus is a genius in the kitchen. I love uh, the way he keeps his food so simple and yet so breathtaking at the same time. What have you made of today's lunch, Mr. Yordan? No, as I said at the outset, I'm completely spoiled. I mean, this is a taste sensation. Um, and just, you know, while we were talking, I've, I've had a go only at the vegetables up to date. I haven't trusted myself to go into the lovely, lovely um, uh, 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 ham yet. But um, I can smell it as we're talking, and um, it really is mouthwatering. Bertus has got a creative genius to him, as a number of our top chefs do. And it's not just the food industry. One of the things I've found in my now 20 odd years here in South Africa is it is a country of extraordinary people, not just people who are incredibly resilient, but people who do see opportunities and are able to make good on them. And I would suggest that it's that characteristic and you can't apply it blanket to 60 odd million people, but it is seen in a lot of people in South Africa, it's that ability to be resilient, to take opportunities and, and to make the most of whatever opportunity is there that probably going to see us through as, as well as anything. Yes, it's sometimes tough to see that in the middle of the crisis, but there is an incredible resilience. Um, and I, I, I do think that if we take the right decisions, we will come out of it much stronger and we will have made some changes which has drawn the future a lot closer. So, for example, the fact that you and I can have a video conference now, that has become the de facto way of having business meetings. I had a very successful two-and-a-half-hour board meeting this morning, and everybody was not only all over South Africa, people were all over the world, and it functioned incredibly well. So that's the new way of doing it. Now, that new way of doing may well apply to education. Um, my, my daughters are writing exams at home, um, and... The questions are randomized, so even if you know people were to sit next to each other, they, they couldn't look at each other's answers, which is the new way of, of conducting education. Um, so we are resilient, but resilience doesn't just mean being tough and toughing it out. It, it does mean being open to new ways of doing it and being pragmatic and being flexible. Would you say then, and I know you're a natural optimist at heart, but would you say that you feel reasonably confident that South Africa's future will be okay and that we can get through the next six, nine, 12 months and, and get back on our feet to a reasonable degree? Um, again, I, I am an optimist and I'm optimistic about South Africa and I am patriotic, but I am still waiting for execution of some of the decisions that have been made. So the execution for me would be, we've got to get tough on crime and corruption. You know, there's a national prosecuting authority that seems to be competent, but, you know, the cases aren't happening. We need to see some of the crooks go to jail. We need to see people that have had fraudulent companies listed on the stock exchange or, or people that have had deals that are improper deals. They need to be prosecuted. So I, I think that's the first thing I would, I would look for. The second thing, from a government perspective, um, we, we're running out of debt or debt capacity. Um, and then you have to prioritize what you want to spend on. And South Africa needs spending on things like health and education and safety and security and infrastructure, not on bailing out airlines, for example. So um, I'm of that school of thought, which is this is a tough time. Don't waste a good prices. Make the right decisions. And like many other countries, we absolutely have the inherent capability to come out of it better. But I, I suppose what I'm telling you is I, like many other South Africans, are waiting for those tough decisions to be made um, so that we can get on with it. They are very tough indeed. I think the entire country is crossing fingers very firmly that we will see those sorts of decisions made, at which point we would celebrate, and rightfully so. Uh, and so I want to celebrate Renote, and as we draw towards the end of our conversation with you, I know you've still got a lot of your lunch to go, uh, but mostly because I can't hold off any longer. There is some vanilla cheesecake sitting in front of me, Michael. I suspect you have the same. I think this might be a good opportunity uh, to try it out and see what the Bertus Besson uh, yeah. piece de résistance is like. 
Oh. Mm. Uh, and I'd just like to clarify, uh, because we both have very strict wives. Um, Mrs. Nickel, Mrs. Jordan, if you're watching this, uh, this is a prop and it's actually made completely of cauliflower. So uh, it's not really a delicious, rich, sweet yeah. vanilla tea cake. Mm. How's yours, Michael? Absolutely delicious. It really is. And um, mm. it's always a pleasure talking to you, Dan. But if you can throw in a meal by bath, because on top of it, um, the only thing, obviously, that we will have next time when we do this is a, it's a great bottle of bread. Which I will look forward to, and preferably in person. I'll ask you for one more nugget of wisdom before we depart and, and say goodbye for now. If you are a business owner in South Africa, you're feeling really unsettled, you're not sure if your company's going to survive, are you going to be able to pay your employees, are you going to be able to look after your own family? And this is a very real situation for a lot of South Africans at the moment. I can't expect as much of a genius as you may be, that you're going to be able to fix all of those problems for everybody with a click of a finger. But what words of counsel, of comfort can you give to somebody in that space in terms of, of just hanging on and getting through the next stretch? Dan, I, I heard a great quote the other day which said, um, even though there's this um, virus that is affecting the whole world, it's not that we're in the same boat, we're in the same storm. Um, which, which means people are on lots of different boats and there are a whole lot of different answers um, to all of them. You know, to people who are privileged enough to have capital, I would say, you know, now's a really good time to spend it or to invest it, you know, and don't just cling on to it. And when you spend it, spend it in your local community because you can make a massive difference to, let's say, your local restaurant. Um, and if, uh, if you invest it, Invest it in startups. There are people out there with brilliant ideas. They've got execution. They've got traction. They just need your capital to be spent. For people who are, you know, on the other side of the storm, um, I would say that it's it's very important to just go back to first principles. What are the things that you really need in your life? You know, many of us have far too many things. I'll, I'll give you some good advice that, that nobody wants to hear, and that is simplify your life. And, um, and, and try and pay off some of your debts, you know. Maybe you don't need that, you know, kind of second or third house or, um, or that fancy car or, or, or whatever it is. And, and then work on recreating the future. I find much of what we do is revisiting the past. And it's important to know about the past and to know about your history and to learn from history. But we are actually all in the position to be able to create the future that we want. And maybe the final thing is, in that future, what I've learned is, one doesn't need that much. You need your family and the love of your family. You need friends. Yes, you need a roof over your head and, 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 and something to eat. But I think there are many, many excesses in life. So don't always just run after those excesses. Look at the really important things in life. And oftentimes they're right in front of you. I would probably add one last piece of advice from a, a far smaller base of experience, but I think uh, an extremely valuable one. If you can somehow find out what Michael Jordan is investing in, do the same and you will be absolutely fine. Uh, Michael, you've had such an extraordinary journey. We've barely touched on it today. I know there are a whole lot of other spaces, in particular, the work you're doing with coding and youth education and providing books online for people that are also so dynamic. And if you have the opportunity, you've got a little bit of time online, go and do a bit of Googling, see some of the other projects that Michael is involved with. But for the sake of today, I think some measured optimism you've given us, definitely some fabulous guidance, a little bit of counsel and some of your own life experience, which has been quite a journey so far, uh, coupled with a marvellous meal from Bertus Besson. And this has probably been as good an hour as I've had in lockdown. Thank you, Dan. It's been great talking to you. And, and the only thing I have to say about all those projects, it really isn't me. I'm, I'm lucky that there are great entrepreneurs doing all those things. I'm you know, lucky to have the family that I have. And, and, and really, that's what you've got to focus on. You know, the people who detract energy and um, get them out of your life and focus on those people that bring happiness and progress and, and you will be as well. Always a smile on his face, always somebody. It's a pleasure to hear from Michael Yodan. Thank you so much. Our latest guest on Business Unknown with Bright Rock as we talk to South African business leaders and entrepreneurs, learn from their journeys and get a little guidance, a little counsel as we attempt to navigate the stormy seas which we currently find ourselves in. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to Bertus Besson for supplying us with a fabulous lunch. His new restaurant, Overture, is back up and running, albeit uh, 
uh, only a few days a week. Uh, so thank you, Bertas. But most importantly, thank you very much uh, to Michael Jordan. And thank you to Mrs. Jordan, to Rose, uh, who let Michael off doing the washing up, which he was supposed to be doing at the moment. I'll be back again next week with another episode of Business Unknown with Brightrock. I'm Dan Nichols. Thank you for joining us. Keep safe and stay strong. Goodbye. <laughs>